excuse me, but I've always been curious. What makes a person want to work in a morgue? I like a job where you meet people. <laughs> You're crazy. No, not crazy. Just a little neurotic. I don't act crazy, do I? No, of course not. Don't you worry, mister. My pal's young Dr. Kildare. I'll speak to him and he won't let him do anything to you. Thank you, sir. Don't forget to tell the doctor. With his sad eyes, solemn expression, and dour New England accent, Milton Parsons was the perfect cinematic undertaker, slightly old-fashioned and humorously grim. Indeed, it's a role he often essayed, along with various mad scientists and lunatics, religious fanatics, and creepy butlers. It's hard to imagine him as a winner of a class popularity contest, or playing Romeo to a rapt audience, or dressing as a woman for a comedy play, but these are all facets of his character. Beneath his best-known persona, Milton's talents were manifold. Speak of the devil. <laughs> Ernest Milton Parsons was born in Gloucester, Massachusetts on May 19, 1904. His father, Ernest D. Parsons, worked as a grocery clerk and had come from a line of Parsons residing in Gloucester since about 1650. Ernest married Sarah E. Nutton on November 5, 1901, and Ernest Milton, called simply Milton, was their only child. For unknown reasons, Ernest Parsons abandoned his small family when Milton was quite young, leaving Sarah to fend for herself. She died suddenly in 1917 from a cerebral hemorrhage, and her son, not yet 13, went to live with his maternal Aunt Estella and her husband, Willard Pierce, in Stratford, New Hampshire. Milton finished his basic schooling in Stratford, then enrolled as an English major at Boston University in 1923. In May of 1925, Milton took the male lead in Boston University's production of Romeo and Juliet, opposite his future wife, Colette Rosiel Humphrey. Milton Parsons of Rochester, New Hampshire, played Romeo and performed with an ease not usual in college productions. As a junior, he took first prize in the Dramatic Club's first annual playwriting competition with Wispy and Whisper, and he was voted most notable student for literature and dramatics. As a senior, he was chairman of the Boston University Dramatic Club and a romancer, one of the inner circle of the club. He was also editor-in-chief of the college's literary publication, The Beacon. Milton graduated from Boston University in 1927 with a major in English and minors in German and public speaking. Hello, Max. Oh, it's you, Shane. Mm-hmm. Say, that's the hit tune from Lathrop's show you were playing, isn't it? Yeah, I wrote it. In 4-4 four, four time, would we make a nice dirge for his funeral? What's on your mind, Shane? Oh, nothing. I just thought I'd drop in, toss the gab with you. Uh, hey, what's this? You doing your own housework now? Oh, I use that to dust off guys like you. Hey, that's pretty good. 
I didn't know you were a magician, too. Guy's got to eat. I pick up a few extra bucks with these gadgets, benefits and smokers. After graduation, he and three companions formed a repertory company with Colette and Milton co-directing. The Our Theater Group lasted with some success for three years, from 1928 to 1930. While working on her master's degree at BU, Colette had established a dramatic program for the Revere City Schools in Massachusetts. She was employed as instructor in dramatics at the Revere High School in 1926 and remained active with the BU Dramatics Club as well. She appeared in most of our theater productions and served on the crew in various capacities, including production and staging. Miss Humphrey is one of the busiest young women in our theater, and last night she played in every offering. She was Viola in Twelfth Night, Puck in the fairy sequence from A Midsummer Night's Dream, and a Turkish dancing girl in the scenes from the Moyer play. Between our theater productions, the pair continued to perform whenever the opportunity arose. In 1928, Milton was a member of the Strolling Players and appeared in drag in the two-character play, The Acid Test, as well as The Dance Below. He also directed plays for the Boston University Drama Club. In 1930, he landed two parts in the Broadway play, The Royal Virgin. In 1933, he had a part in Unto the Third, also on Broadway, and later in Right This Way. The company performed during a Canadian cruise in August 1932 aboard the SS California to an audience of 865 passengers. Milton once said that his most horrendous year was the one he spent putting on plays on cruise ships. Renew these vows and continue this devotion so long as you both shall live. After working closely together for years, Milton and Colette made their association permanent. They were married in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts on June 28, 1933. I got it. I got it. They all laugh at me, look down at me. I'll make it a little more powerful and they'll all look up at me. After our theater dissolved, Milton became part of the Mary Young Theater Group and was especially active starting in 1936. Why don't you sit down right now and write a nice long letter to Dr. Habakkuk Twist and tell him about your gallstones? Milton Parsons has in one summer played in 10 countries, two hurricanes and a revolution. The countries included Cuba, South America, the West Indies, and somewhere in the Arctic Circle. Milton's transition to the movies came in 1939. After its award-winning first run on Broadway, Thornton Wilder's Our Town, directed by Frank Craven, was released to touring companies. It opened in Los Angeles at the Biltmore Theater on April 4, 1939, with Milton playing choir master Simon Stimson, a man troubled by drink and bitterness. At the conclusion of the run, he found himself with a motion picture contract at MGM. Parsons was passed over when Our Town came to the movies in 1940. Philip Wood, who had the part of choir master on Broadway, was given the role instead. All right, that's better. <clears throat> It ain't no miracle. However, Milton was to play the church organist and choir master in When Tomorrow Comes, his first film at Universal. Are you hungry? I'm so hungry I could eat anything that wouldn't bite me first. 
Uh, there's chicken. Uh -huh. uh, and cheese. Thank you. Uh, some people say that music is the food of love. But personally, I always have to have three square meals a day. <laughs> Mr. Henderson, please hurry. Uh, coming. Uh, will you have something else? Uh, no, thank, thank you. you. Uh, in 1939 and 1940 alone, he appeared in nine features for MGM, as well as several Our Gang shorts and three films at Republic. I don't like the looks of the road, especially in this weather. Now, if it's all right with these gentlemen, I suggest we stay here for the night and get an early start in the morning. What do we got, Doc? Bruise on left temple, blunt instrument. Throat cut with fairly large, heavy blade. Death instantaneous. Right wrist broken. Been dead about half an hour. They check with the time they found him. Check. That ought to be enough to go on. I'll go into things more thoroughly tomorrow. Thanks, Doc. John Lloyd's the name. Representing Dixie Monument makers. Branches everywhere. I've got to get to Wisteria Hall tonight. But this is Wisteria Hall. Well, then. How about this tombstone? We want nothing but the best, of course. Now, I'd suggest a marble column topped with a pair of doves. His popularity as a character actor was to continue into the 1960s, resulting in a filmography of over a hundred movies before his last big screen appearance in 1974's Dirty O'Neill. Milton and Collette settled into John and Helen Kibbe's guest house on Andorra in the town of Chatsworth. Paulette gave birth to daughter Sally Ann Parsons on September 3, 1940, and the cast was complete. Mr. Kincaid? Yes, yes. Tell me, is it a boy? Boy? You mean boys. Mister, you're the father of triplets. Oh! Oh, Susie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Better than Thank you. Say, mister, how would you like to be the father of an awfully nice boy? What? As character parts in both A and B pictures began to pour in, the steady work at the studios allowed them to purchase their own home. The house at 10801 Farallone in Chatsworth was to become their permanent residence as well as their own theater and school for the rest of their lives. What's happened to the traditions at show business? This man's a mere charlatan, appropriating other performers' material. A true comedian should improvise. Tony, wash the dishes. If I wanted a critic, I would have hired Walter Winchell. Not for what you're paying me. Although straight dramatic roles sometimes came his way, Milton was often chosen for his precise timing and delivery, which he used to add comic relief to a plethora of mysteries. Sometimes he even exhibited a skill for slapstick. I'll just put the head right on top. Yeah. I won't be a second. I... You got your heads on the wrong people. Huh? Huh? Oh. Shepherds, do you mind? George, 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 he appeared in numerous installments of popular series films during the 40s, including Charlie Chan, Dr. Kildare, Ellery Queen, Dick Tracy, The Bowery Boys, and Abbott and Costello. On this floor, coroner. We'll find it. Well, we didn't have far to look. Looks like he's been dead for weeks. Dump him in the basket, boys. His characters were usually slightly eccentric morticians, butlers, and clerks, but Milton showed a decidedly serious side as a hitman several times, as well as a garroter and an axe murderer. We just want to know why you killed Gianellis. <laughs> just try to think. 
Where did you get the weapon? The axe. He isn't listening. He doesn't even hear me now. Uh huh. He's in the midst of an hallucination. Some of his jobs were little more than walk ons, but he had substantial parts in several films during this period. He played the homicidal escaped maniac John Channing in 1942's The Hidden Hand, disguised as a what else? A butler. That's why I sent you those presents. Quite welcome, they were too. Oh, 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 oh. I kept the rope and tied up one of the guards in the grounds. Not really. Oh, but I did. And pulled him high up in the branches of a tree where they won't find him for days. It must have been fun to watch him wriggle about in the treetop. Oh, it was fun. Till he stopped. Perhaps I shouldn't have tied the rope around his neck. In Gas House Kids in Hollywood, he was a scientist trying to restore life to the dead. But of course. That was the accepted method in Romania in the 14th century. Between movies, both Milton and Colette, and later Sally Ann, were very active in their community, serving with the PTA and the Historical Society. Colette was a Campfire Girls leader as well. In 1949, the Parsons formed the Cookie Jar Theater Group for Children. Milton's Hollywood friends including Barry Fitzgerald, Paul Kelly, Alexander Knox, Florence Bates, and others lent their support to the efforts. The 1951 season opened with Little Women, with Milton directing from Colette's script and Sally Ann playing the part of Beth. By popular demand from the community, Milton and Colette opened a school of dramatic technique and expression at their Fairlone home in October of 1951, giving weekly classes to children from the primary grades through high school. That reminds us most of Jesus in his love for humble people and his readiness for self-sacrifice. Who reminds us most of the disciples, because of their loyal attachment to the Fuhrer. Hey, Dr. Gerdos, Milton was to appear on the Broadway stage two more times. In May of 1948, he played the part of Saul of Tarsus in The Vigil, and in 1950, he appeared with Frederick March and Florence Eldridge in Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep a comedy directed by Hume Cronin. Milton played a Polish refugee and garnered good reviews. Sally Ann, then nine years old, had parts as three different children. With the rise of television in the 1950s, Milton became a familiar face on the small screen. His first appearance was on I Love Lucy in 1952. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> you could at least let me show you a more realistic looking wig than that. <laughs> wig? This is my own hair. Oh, come now. Well, it is, see? Stop. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, my goodness, so it is. <gasps> Mr. Thurlow! Well, business hasn't been so good lately. I need the ten bucks. Thank you. Milton's movie appearances dropped to about one a year, but his television guest appearances took up the slack. He appeared in many of the early anthology programs including Climax, Lux Video Theater, Playhouse 90, and Schlitz Playhouse. As the television landscape changed in the late 50s and into the 60s, Milton's characters seemed to mirror the ones he had played in the cinema in the 30s and 40s, undertakers, room clerks, 
mad doctors, and an occasional murderer. He was on detective shows, westerns, dramas, and sitcoms. Well, of course, Mr. Peabody, I didn't really sprain my ankle. I just twisted it. I'll be walking out of here first thing Tuesday morning. That's what I thought, until the complications set in. Complications? What kind? Who knows? They ain't been able to find them yet. <laughs> Six weeks ago, I come here a healthy man. Now look at me. Even my hair hurts. Back on the home front, Sally Ann graduated from Canoga Park High School in 1958 with a sack full of honors and awards. She had been editor of the school paper, class president, and valedictorian. She entered Occidental College that fall on scholarship, majoring in English and creative writing. She had her eye on a political career, but the theater was her heritage. By 1973, Sally Ann was working as a cutter and designer assistant at the prestigious Ray Diffin Stage Clothes in New York and doing freelance work across the country. Sally Ann married James G. Mears on New Year's Eve in 1979, and in 1980, she and her husband opened the Parsons Mears Costume Shop in New York City. The pair have a staff of about 60 and have created costumes for New York shows such as Cats and The Phantom of the Opera, as well as television and film, including Bram Stoker's Dracula. kindred soul when I see one. The minute I laid eyes on you, I said to myself, Threadneedle, there goes your kind of man. A real live wire. You really think so? Yes, sir. I had, uh, what line did you say we're in? Uh, electrical research, you might say. Oh, a fine growing field. You know, a good man could make a real killing in that. It's possible. <laughs> yes. I'm doing scientific research you know what I am I'm the first electrocutioner you know it's a wonderful feeling a really wonderful feeling having a real friend mister what's your name despite their busy schedules Milton and Collette formed the Cornerstone Club in early 1959 to develop the Chatsworth Summer Theater. They made modifications to their home on Fairlone, creating a stage and proscenium against the building, as well as an outdoor area in the gardens. It was a nonprofit organization presenting adult plays as well as children's matinee performances throughout the summer. That first year's plays included The Solid Gold Cadillac, Jaunus, and Our Town. In addition to directing, Milton returned to his own stage the first season, playing the part of Doc Lyman in Bus Stop. Lyman is a complex character, a rebel and an alcoholic, similar to the role from Our Town that brought Milton to Hollywood 20 years before. Mm -hmm. Secretly, I, I've always believed that I did not want people to think I was crazy. poison are you pushing today? <laughs> the specialty of the house is the inferno. Oh, marvelous. Well, let's try a couple, huh? Oh, I think and a so. ginger ale for the lady? Right. Two infernos and one ginger ale. That's eight dollars. Eight dollars? Plus tip. 
in the 1960s and into the 70s, Milton's television work was in high gear, with seven appearances the first year of the decade. He was a natural choice for supernatural programs and for comically grim episodes of other shows of the day. On the big screen, he continued to be in demand for his eccentric characterizations. He played his last cinematic eccentric in the movie The Silent Call as a slightly skewed hobo named Muhammad. How you doing, man? Right on your door. My name's Mohammed. After the Indian Muslim League. But you can call me Mo. So what? Say, think maybe you fellas could agree to share in some food? Uh, if you got any more. Uh, I, I haven't eaten in three days. You're a liar. No, it's the truth. There ain't no reason for a wanderer to stop this day and age unless he's stupid. Or unless he refuses to steal. Get yourself a job. I can't seem to work. I, I tried it, but I just can't. Among his final films were The Haunted Palace in 1963, in which he played a henchman to Vincent Price's Warlock and a walk-on in Hitchcock's Marnie. After a five-year absence, he made his final movie in 1974, playing a police chief in the comedy Dirty O'Neill. In 1953, Squirrel Franklin tried to beat me to death with a 50-cent bag of jelly beans. Imagine that. Tried to kill me with a bag of jelly beans. You're lucky. Could have been jawbreakers. Milton's television appearances would continue until 1978 and included two TV movies, Griffin and Phoenix, in which he was a professor lecturing on the psychology of dying. He lied to children through euphemisms about three places, the bedroom, the bathroom, and the grave. And 1973's Cat Creature. So uh, you think it might be, it might be the same type of animal? The same animal? The bacterial cultures from the wounds of both victims are identical. Rabies? No indication. Then uh, what you're saying is that these men were killed and attacked by a common domestic cat? I'm not offering an opinion. My job is to give the evidence. It doesn't make any sense. One thing more, Lieutenant. The bodies of both victims were almost completely drained of blood. On February 26, 1980, Colette passed away. She and Milton had been married 56 years, sharing a common interest in theater through some very hard times and continuing into successful, fulfilling, and intertwined careers. They had worked together, side by side, since their school years, Romeo and Juliet for all time. Less than three months later, on May 14th, Ernest Milton Parsons joined his wife. His body was cremated and the ashes scattered. Over nearly a 40-year screen career, Milton Parsons' face has become familiar to generations of fans of horror films, mysteries, comedies, musicals, westerns, and dramas. His distinctive voice and style brought him to the foreground of every scene he played, whether his part was large or small. He was truly one of a kind. No drugs, no surgery, no down payment. Told us to open up the house and make this train. Don't know what's up. Sounds kind of mysterious. Yes, it does. Told us not to tell a soul. Then don't. I won't. Told me. Oh, heck. Theodore, this is you know who. You've got a little situation here, and I want you to contact certain parties and tell them to stand by for a getaway. Better have their bags packed. Ready? Honest John McCafferty in Boston. 
Honest John Brancuso in Philadelphia. Honest John Mankiewicz in Pittsburgh. Major Culpepper in Richmond. Colonel Culpepper in Atlanta. Brigadier General Culpepper in New Orleans. Dear, yeah, dear, let me think. I can't think of a thing. Thank you.